I've been writing about and photographing wildlife for over 40 years. We put the following tape together to help you do a better job with your bird photography. Most people would love to travel to very exotic places to photograph birds, such as this tawny eagle found in Africa, or this male ostrich performing his mating or courtship dance to impress the female. This male frigate bird, photographed in the Galapagos Islands, is sitting with his throat inflated to attract the female to the nest which he has built. We could go down to the southwestern part of the United States or northern Mexico to photograph the Liechtenstein's Oriole or the beautiful green jay. As inviting as all this traveling sounds, most people, in fact, are more likely to see and to be able to photograph birds at their bird feeders, such as this chickadee, this white-throated sparrow, or this purple finch, which is busy cracking a sunflower seed. I always recommend that people interested in doing bird photography start in their own backyard where they have unlimited convenient subjects. The question I'm asked most frequently is what kind of equipment is needed? Here is the equipment I use from the most basic to the most sophisticated. A camera, motor drive unit, normal lens, teleconverters, an 80 to 200 millimeter zoom lens, and the 400 and 600 millimeter lenses. The camera should be a single lens reflex which will take interchangeable lenses. This is a must because no one lens will allow you to do every job properly. Many people will not need the motor drive, although we use ours constantly. Not only when we are doing action work in order to get as many pictures as possible in a short time, but the motor drive also allows us to get the exposed film out of the camera quickly in a new roll in, a must when the action is good. You can always obtain a motor drive as an accessory later on if you find you need or want one. We recommend that you obtain a 50 to 55 millimeter macro or a micro lens rather than getting the standard 50 millimeter lens that usually comes with the camera. The reason is that the standard lens will not focus down to much closer than 18 inches from your subject, while the macro lens will allow you to get anywhere from 5 to 7 inches from your subject, permitting you to photograph birds' eggs, nests, and other subjects close up. For most people, the 80 to 200 millimeter or the 70 to 210 millimeter will probably be their basic lens. We also recommend using teleconverters to increase the focal length of all of your lenses, providing the teleconverters are made by the same company as your lens. Do not mix them. Here are the 1.4 and 2x teleconverters. When used on a 400 millimeter lens, the 1.4 teleconverter effectively changes a 400 millimeter to a 560 millimeter lens, and the 2x makes an 800 millimeter lens. They also change an F4 lens to an F5.6 and F8 lens, respectively. The 400 millimeter lens is the lens I recommend most highly for wildlife photography. However, instead of using just a straight 400, I am currently using a 200 to 400 millimeter zoom lens, which allows me to photograph either the entire bird or just its head at the same distance. It is much more versatile than the straight 400 millimeter lens. The 600 millimeter is the big gun of the battery. If you can afford it, I would advise you to obtain this lens because it will enable you to photograph small birds at a distance of 30 to 40 feet. When you couple this lens with the 1.4 or 2x converter, this in turn makes it an 840 or 1200 millimeter lens. This lens most definitely must always be used with a tripod. Here is a basic tripod I use for most of my work. The legs are camouflaged with tape for field work to prevent the shiny legs from frightening the wildlife with their glare. Below it is a monoball head which fits on the top of the tripod and holds the camera. This is a quick release monoball which allows me to change the lens and camera faster, particularly in cold weather when I find it difficult to thread a camera or lens onto a standard ball head tripod fitting. Below that is a monoball collar which slips between the monoball and the quick release plate, locking it so the head can't turn when you are carrying your tripod bearing a heavy lens and camera over your shoulder. Another type of camera support is a groove win, or ground roof window pod, which allows you to photograph from your vehicle. Much of the photography in refuges will be done out of your vehicle's window or from the hood. I also use a groove win in my home as a window pod. In addition, it also allows you to photograph subjects from ground level. To show you that I practice what I preach, I'm now going to demonstrate how to use your home as a bird blind. Over the years, the entire area surrounding my house has been planted with shrubs that have berries which are attractive to birds. 
These plantings have been carefully situated to provide cover for the birds which come to my feeders. I also have large lilac and bridal veil bushes on each corner of the house. No matter how much food you put out, birds will not flock to your feeders unless you have adequate close cover for them to dive into in the event that a predator appears. Many people take photographs of birds through their windows. I do not recommend that you do this because it will affect the quality of your photographs. I have triple glazing on my windows, which means there are six air to glass surfaces which can cause distortion. And unless your room is properly darkened, you may get a reflection of your camera from the glass. If your home is like mine, there will be a few pieces of furniture that you have to move in order to get to the window from which you are going to photograph. I want you to notice that I probably have the only home you have seen which has camouflage curtains. They will hide you and your movements from the bird's view so they are not frightened away by seeing you so close on the other side of the window. You don't really need to have camouflage curtains, but I do recommend hanging cloth curtains rather than just cutting a piece of cardboard or plywood to put in the window to hide you. Most importantly, the cloth allows you more lens movement and flexibility, but they also will be a permanent part of the window which the birds are accustomed to seeing there, and so will not be made nervous by something new appearing in the window. It's important to disturb the birds as little as possible so they will continue their normal behavior and you will be able to get the photographs you want. I cut a large V in the curtain to accommodate my lens. I prefer using a groove win instead of a tripod in this situation because the groove win can be hung on the window frame and you do not have the tripod legs on the inside of the room where they can get in your way. Reverse the rubber legs of the groove win so that the rubber is against the wall's paneling and doesn't mar. After adjusting the groove wind to the proper height and making certain it's good and solid, pull the curtain across in the front of it. If there's a strong cold wind blowing, you can use a thumbtack to tack the curtain against the window frame to prevent the wind from blowing into the room. Using the rapid release knob, I place my 600 millimeter lens into the slot and tighten it into place. I'm going to try for extreme close-ups by placing a 1.4 extender on the camera body before fastening it on the lens, giving me an 840 millimeter lens length. It is important to remember that using the extender cuts down the light by one full stop, so my F4 lens is now an F5.6. Photographs I'm after in this situation are of birds at a bird feeder. These pictures are both pleasing and satisfying because many people are accustomed to seeing birds at a feeder. Pictures like these are quite saleable. Many seed companies and publishers need pictures of birds at a feeder. The first guest that came to the feeder was this tufted titmouse with a sunflower seed in his bill. Titmice are quite fearless in addition to being very attractive and therefore make good photographic subjects. The purple finches are daily visitors to my feeder in the winter time and in the spring cowbirds come in to feed on the smaller seeds. Now I want to include more of the background. I will exchange my 600 millimeter lens for this shorter 80 to 200 f2.8 lens which will allow me to cover a much wider area than does the 600. While this will not allow me to take bird portraits, it will permit me to take general feeding area shots. Using the base release knob, I move the monoball and camera farther back on the groove wind because I don't want any more lens protruding outside the curtain than is absolutely necessary. Next, I close the Velcroed V-slit to fit the lens. Now I am able to encompass the entire bird feeder through my camera lens, zooming to allow for the most effective framing and focusing for critical sharpness. These shots are good as they show a number of birds at the feeder at one time. I've had as many as four or five different species of birds on the feeder at one time and thus in my photographs as well. While pictures taken at a feeding station are pleasing and saleable, they should not be taken exclusively as the most saleable bird portraits are those taken with the birds sitting on branches. Here we see a female cardinal sitting on a branch. However, unless you are able to control the situation, it will be very difficult to get good bird portraits. It is impossible to tell where the birds will land with so many branches and so much brush in the area.
This male cardinal is close but cannot be photographed to the best advantage because there is so much brush obscuring him. Also, there is a piece of pipe holding an outdoor light switch on the left side of the area. I cannot move the pipe, but I can move the camera so this pipe is not in the photograph. With no control over where the birds are going to land and with objectionable objects in the background, it makes it very difficult to get the portrait type photographs that will please both our eyes and those of magazine editors. In order to be a successful photographer, whether it be of landscapes, people, or animals, it is vitally important to know your subjects, to develop a feel for them. With wildlife, the more you know about the behavior of the species in general and the personality of the individual animal itself, the more likely you are to be able to get that once-in-a-lifetime shot. I've always loved and respected wildlife. Animals and birds can sense that respect and will respond to it. If you can develop a bond of trust with a creature, it'll be more photographable. And it is crucial that a photographer not violate that bond once it has been formed. We are morally obligated to see that no harm comes to the creatures we photograph as a direct result of our activities. One of the things I've delighted in doing over the years is to get wild birds to eat from my hand. I start off by getting the birds to eat seeds on a hat. Then I put the hat on my head. When I transferred the seeds to my hand, the birds were still accustomed to going back to the hat for them, but eventually learned to take the seeds from my hand. This took about two and a half hours to accomplish, but it was well worth the time and effort because it shows how you can control your subject's behavior. I'm now going to show you how to photograph birds on a natural branch in order to get the portrait type pictures I've been talking about. I have one feeder located on the corner of my porch where I feed the birds constantly and to which they are accustomed to coming for food. It is their habit to land on this tree branch before dropping down to the feeder. For my photographs, I want the birds to land approximately on those two spots and only those two spots. I don't want to have the woodpile or the building showing in the background, so I'm going to separate the branches of the lilac bush, tying one back to get it out of the way, and by using a pipe to position the branch I want to the right so the building in the background will not show when I'm using a tight-framed 840 millimeter lens. As you can see, the birds are now landing where predicted. Knowing that I could get them to do this comes from hours of observation of bird behavior. The birds are fed here continuously and are used to landing on these branches before going to the feeder. We now have a good forest background. As seen through the camera lens, there is no evidence that the birds are coming into the feeder. For all practical purposes, the birds are any place out in a woodland area. Long hours of observation show that the white-breasted nuthatch ordinarily landed on the top branch, jumped to the upright branch, and climbed down upside down. So when I wanted to photograph him, it was essential to get my camera set on that precise spot. He doesn't stay there for more than just a second, so I must have my camera pre-focused and the exposure set in advance. I took my exposure reading from the woods in the background, pre-focused on the spot where he would land, and here is the result. The cardinal has landed on one of the upper branches. The tufted titmouse feeds heavily and can be counted on to come in regularly. All these pictures I have been showing you are pleasing and saleable. However, the background is rather monochromatic. Sometimes photographers and editors want this type of coloring of gray or brown birds against a woodland background. Now, let's see how we can use the same location but add some color to it. I don't know what you do with your old Christmas tree, but I use mine all winter long. I'm going to use it to introduce color into the background of this scene. By introducing green, I'm making it into an evergreen forest scene. I've taken a stepladder and am wiring the tree to hold it upright, securing it in the position where I want it. It has to be wired securely so it doesn't blow over the first time the wind comes along. That Christmas tree remained upright for several months. Be very careful to wire it in such a way that the wire does not show in your photographs. Now I want the birds to land in these two spots. I always look to be sure the green is in behind the spots where I want it. Here is a bird landing where I wanted it to, except now we have a green forest background. We have the same bird, the same branches, but it's not apparent because we have changed the background by introducing color. Here's our old standby, the white-breasted nuthatch coming in, but this time with an evergreen forest background. Although the tree sparrow landed to the right of the bush, there is sufficient green on the left-hand side to still indicate the forest setting. This tufted titmouse landed farther to the left than I wanted him to, but there is still enough green showing to take away the monochromatic scene. Now, a word of caution. We are trying to depict birds in a forested area, so I can't use this picture of a bird with a sunflower seed in its mouth. A sure sign that it had just flown from a feeder to sit on a branch and open the seed. 
Although there is a forest background, this titmouse has a seed in its beak from the feeder. Using this purple finch as an example of what to do, simply wait until he has opened the seed, dropped the hull, swallowed the kernel, and then, before he returns to his feeder for another seed, photograph him without the seed. This particular picture could have been taken anywhere in the out of doors. Now I'm going to show you how to make the birds land on the precise spot where you want them. If you will look in the background, you will notice that there are dozens of birds flying in and out of the feeder area. This cardinal is landing on a branch which I had brought in from the woods and fastened to a stump. Now I'm introducing a perch. Most birds will land on the very last perch between cover and the seed feeder. Particularly if there are a lot of birds feeding, they come in, almost like airplanes stacked up, waiting for a chance at the runway. By nailing the branch to a stump, I have control over where I want to place it. I want the birds to land on this precise spot, so I need to cut off this branch which is in the way. It would be in front of the birds, so I simply eliminate it so as not to be a distraction in the finished photograph. This branch is also in a way, so we will eliminate it too. The next thing to do is observe the birds landing to see which perch they prefer. It doesn't take long for the action to begin. You will notice that some birds are bypassing the stick. This will always happen, but the bulk of them will utilize a perch, particularly when the number of birds coming in is very heavy. Again, you can see the similarity to the airport when the winged creatures are stacking up. Many of the birds will not tolerate another bird at the feeder, so they fly in, grab a seed, and fly off with it. Notice that many of the birds seem to prefer the left perch over the right one. However, now that they are landing there, I can see that there is a shadow which falls across their body, as seen on this cardinal. In order to eliminate the possibility of the birds landing on that branch, where the shadow will fall across their body, we'll simply cut it off, forcing the birds to land on the right-hand side, where there will be no distracting shadows. Now, in order to reduce the area on which we must focus, we're going to take off the top limbs and the far outside part of this perch so they will have to land in toward the center. This requires you to focus in on a very small area. Be very careful not to show where the branches have been cut off. Now we can see the exact place where the birds are going to land, and the tufted titmouse is quick to take advantage of that particular spot. And so is this black-capped chickadee. Having removed the other branches, I haven't given them that much of a choice. They have to land where I want them to. The black-capped chickadee is quickly followed by this slate-colored junco, the tufted titmouse, the cardinal, and the tree sparrow. Don't put your camera away just because we have cold, snowy weather. Although the birds are sitting outside, they will have no trouble withstanding the cold as long as you provide them with an ample food supply. We, on the other hand, can sit in the comfort of our homes and record all this beauty on film. I want you to notice this example of an improperly cropped image. You should avoid allowing the cut off end of a branch to show by focusing in on the center and cropping tighter so the viewer cannot see the end of the branch which shows that the site has been manipulated. Now I'm going to shut down one feeder and force the bird to back over to the porch feeder. We'll use our forest background as a snowy landscape. I simply remove the seeds from the feeder where the birds have been eating and put them on the other feeder, the one over by the porch. That will immediately cut off the action on the near feeder and force the birds to go to the one on the far side. Now we have the same Christmas tree, old Christmas tree, laden with snow, and our photographs will now look as though they were taken in a snowy forest. This slate-colored junco is quick to oblige us. The birds are accustomed to using all these perches. Which particular one they will use at any given time depends on where the food supply is located. It takes them only a few minutes to learn to switch from one feeder to the other because they are familiar with both of them. When you start to feed the birds at your feeders in the fall, it is important to continue to feed them daily throughout the winter as they become dependent on this food source, like this cardinal, for example. Here we can see the results of the photographs taken of the birds in the snowstorm. I have taken these pictures at a slow shutter speed, about one thirtieth of a second, to allow the snow to streak, enhancing the effect of the snowstorm. This little hunched up house sparrow has his feathers fluffed to give him more protection from the cold. A close up of the head of this cardinal shows how much snow is actually coming down. Here's a feeder I had out for both birds and squirrels. However, it is not a natural situation to have a white breasted nuthatch fly into a tree cavity and come out with a seed. While it provides food for the creatures and trains them come into that spot, it shows man's manipulation, something we do not wish to show in our finished photographs. However, we can use it as a tool in achieving those pictures. The simplest thing to do in this case is to go out and plug the hole. The birds are so accustomed to finding food there that they will continue to come in even when that food source has been blocked off. By stuffing my handkerchief into the hole, the birds will be unable to get into that hole. 
This white-breasted nuthatch wonders what happened, what shut off the supply of food. And while he's going around the trunk, trying to find another way to get at the seeds, he is in an ideal position to be photographed. And here is the result. The downy woodpecker has also come in to check out the situation and has been captured on my film, as has his hairy woodpecker, which is much larger than a downy. Following the male hairy woodpecker is this male red-bellied woodpecker. All these birds have been accustomed to coming into this site and getting seeds, and so they are prime photographic subjects. The starling has flown to the top of that same post because he is interested in a suet feeder which hangs nearby. While you are busy photographing the birds, always be alert to other photo opportunities. This gray squirrel has been busily feeding beneath the feeder. While a photograph of it on the ground under the feeder would not be desirable, this one of the squirrel before it gets to the ground is definitely a bonus. By keeping alert to things beyond the exact spot on which I'm focused, I was able to photograph this red squirrel running down a limb to get to the feeder from the top. Now we're going to go down to the shore where we see sanderlings working over a mudflat. These are very energetic little birds that always remind me of valve tappets with a rapid up and down motion. To photograph in this area, I am going to use a pocket blind which I devised for just such a situation as this. Approximately the size of a loaf of bread and weighing only two and a quarter pounds, this blind has a little carrying bag which can be fastened on my belt or easily carried in my hand. It is very, very quick to put up and is excellent in this situation where I want to use it instantly. I simply take out my stool, always using one that provides back support, and put one leg on the tripod through the rung of the stool so I can get close to the camera with ease. Opening the carrying bag, I remove the pocket blind and fasten the front opening around my lens. The opening is large enough to accommodate any size lens and has Velcro closures so that when the lens is placed into the opening, the material can then be shirred up very tight around the lens. I carry a couple of heavy duty elastic bands on my 600 millimeter lens and use them to snap over the material around the lens to be sure the fabric stays in place securely. Next, I fold the material over me, closing it around me in the back. In this case, the wind is very strong, yet I am set up and ready to photograph in less than a minute. Speed and ease of setup often makes the difference between getting photographs and not getting them. If it takes you too long to set up, or you must move about a great deal in doing so, the birds may become nervous and your subjects will be gone before you've had a chance to get a single shot. I would recommend practicing your blind setup at home several times before attempting it in the field so that you can do it with speed and as little distracting movement as possible. This blind obscures your shape sufficiently and blends in enough so that most creatures will readily accept it. Here's a little sanderling, the bird we saw landing previously. I was also favored by having a Wilson snipe come in. Greater yellow legs are frequently found on the mud flats, and here's a close-up of a lesser yellow legs, made possible by the use of this blind. Sometimes in a national park or refuge, you don't need any blind at all, but can walk quite close to the birds as they have become accustomed to people who observe them, but do not disturb them. Many of the parks and refuges have boardwalks that anyone can negotiate, even allowing people in wheelchairs to do wildlife photography. One such place is the Anhinga Trail in Florida's Everglade National Park. Every photographer visiting Florida should certainly try this spot. Here is one of the photographs I was able to take there, a picture of the bird for which the trail was named, the Anhinga, also known as the snake darter. Here is another common visitor to that swamp, the purple gallinule, which is primarily a southern bird. As I said before, most of your bird photography will be done from a blind, but sometimes there are welcome exceptions. I try to dress in camouflage clothing at all times and camouflage all of my equipment with either tape or spray paint so nothing about me is conspicuous. With these precautions, I can sometimes get photographed without using a blind. An example would be these pelicans, which are so accustomed to human beings that it's easy to photograph them from various docks and fish cleaning areas. This California gull was photographed in Salt Lake City, where they are found in great numbers. Birds are certainly one of God's greatest gifts to man. We envy them their freedom of flight and try to emulate them with our own planes. I want to remind you in doing bird photography, not only to look up to the heavens to see the bird's passage, but to be aware of the things that may be practically under your feet. For the close-up photographs that follow, I needed my macro lens equipment to capture the iridescent plumage of the wild turkey. 
and the incomparable beauty of a peacock's feather. I love photographing birds. I've worked with them all of my life. We put the preceding tape together to give you the benefit of my years of experience. It's our goal to bring you the very best in instructional videotapes on wildlife photography.